Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get right to it. So if you have in front of you uh, the opportunity to pull up two screens, then pull up a landing page. If not, get one ready that's important to you or to your business. We're going to use that landing page, and I'm going to share content that we've never shared uh, in uh, any of our public sessions. And so, in fact, Paul, if you will, just pull up for a moment the graphic. Most of what I'll teach today is going to come down to this infographic prepared by Megan, one of our designers. And uh, you can just sort of scroll down. So as you're joining, understand that we're going to unpack these 21 psychological elements as this moment unfolds. This will help you think about the ultimate design of your landing page. This indeed is what I use personally when I'm laying out a page. And this has to do with sort of the sequence of thought. So we're going to unpack this model in the session. But before we do, I want to share with you a page and ask you a question. So look at your page so that you can apply what we learned from this model. But as you do that, let me take you to a case study. So by the way, you're going to see us switching back and forth. Paul is right on my right. Uh, he is uh, the director of marketing inside of our organization and frankly has worked with me in content for years. And in the back is Cliff, uh, who's overseeing, he's the executive producer of this and, uh, and the team there. And so I'll talk to them uh, sometimes as we speak. Right now, I want to show you a page. There is a page. Now, I want you to think about it for a second and ask yourself uh, which one of these will produce the most. This is from an old friend. You can see his name, Steve Dybold. Steve's uh, been a longtime member of our community and has uh, you know, studied our work and taken our courses, etc. And Steve has been building a very healthy business. And, uh, I'm proud when I see our students growing uh, their enterprise. And he did so well that uh, he's taken off some of his dependency on Amazon. And uh, one day we'll get him on here to tell his story. But take a look at these two pages. What do you think are the pros and cons? Which one is best and why? So tell me, first of all, using your chat feature, which one of these two pages do you think is the best approach? So let's call the one on the left A and the one on the right B. Dave, good to see you. Joshua Singer, good to see you. And uh, uh, I see Moose Little Thunder. I don't know who that is. I think you're new on here, but uh, you may have been in some of our, but, but in any event, it's good to have you. And uh, some of you others coming back in, I'm recognizing as you're logging in, we pay attention a lot to the chat. We're trying to understand patterns. It's useful data. It helps us see who the regular attenders are to some of these uh, various uh, YouTube live broadcasts. But can you vote? There they come. A, 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 A. Now, We've talked about this, and I, I want you to look at A, but I think most of you will determine already that A is better. We designed A. But what's the primary difference between A and B? Why do you say A? What's happening with A? Uh, and you understand, Steve did well with page B, but as a, but he came to us asking for help. And so we not only did the psychology, we actually did the whole design. We are not an agency, we're a research institute, but we have that capability, and so we designed it inside out, and frankly, that, the whole site. But if you'll look at this page, and it's a site you should go to, there's a lot of psychology and strategy there. What's happening? More white space, someone said, but more white space, it's true, more white space uh, is uh, a difference, but I'm looking for the primary driver of success on that page. What is the primary driver of success? Dave said it's easier to read, too. That's true. Fewer distractions, says Art. That's also true. But what is the primary driver? Sean said colors. Certainly the colors are different. You'll notice the, the, the B page is not terrible. It's better than most. Look at all of that specific. Remember, Steve was a student and actually a consultant for some years. He helped other people and he used a lot of our work as he gave them marketing advice. And uh, so he, he was experienced. So you'll see 20 grams of protein, amazing taste, homemade fresh weekly. He began this company building this in his kitchen. <laughs> and by the way, I, I use the product all the time. It's excellent. Uh, it's uh, really, really good. No preservations or added, no preservatives or added sugars and so on. See the list. So that was, there's a lot of value up there. There's something that suggests the value proposition. But something's happening on the left-hand side. And, and for a page that's already successful, especially in an entrepreneurial venture where every dollar matters, it's interesting to see what happens when you get a difference in the psychology at the level of the thought sequence. You'll see now an 18% increase in revenue. Now, I have spoken to Steve since then, and 
according to him, revenue's gone up significantly more, but I don't want to say that number because I haven't validated it and I wouldn't want to speak for Steve. I just want you to know that there's been a big difference in his business. Now, Sean said something. He said, the right looks underground, the left looks mainstream and acceptable. That's an interesting point, and Joshua pointed out uh, the same fact. Team, watch it and think. And in a minute, think about your page with me. If you're new to our broadcast, stay with us because we're going to get super actionable in a few moments. But I want to challenge you again. Look at two pages. Now, I've shared this, and I'm not going to drill down with your votes right now because I want to get into the meat of the content, but I want you to notice there's a big difference in the thought sequence between page A and page B. And if you haven't seen this case study before, you might start to think about, well, what is the difference? And I would challenge you right now, ask yourself two questions. What's the main difference? And what is the, what is the scope of that difference? What is the scale of that difference? Try to understand in your own mind how the two pages impact the sequence of thought. Because remember, we don't build pages. We don't optimize pages. What we're really doing is, is manipulating a series of pixels in order to produce an illusion that impacts thinking and ultimately the decision process. If you want to get real scientific, I've taught this before so I won't touch it, a page is a set of observations that you put in front of someone and those observations produce or help someone arrive at, and I think I'll go to a darker pen, a conclusion. And you know this. So if you're familiar with my content, stay with me because where we're going next is new, but I have people joining us. And that conclusion precedes the decision. So you're not really designing pages. You're not manipulating people either if you're doing it right. You're manipulating the observation set. And if you, if you manipulate that set of observations, and here's what I mean by that, the headline. The three columns you see on the left-hand side. The flow and content, the page design, the layout, these are all just pixels being turned on by zeros and ones. And if you change the zeros and the ones in a different way, you may get a different inference process. Did you hear me? They infer, your prospective customer infers from the observation set a conclusion, and the conclusion about you precedes the decision to do something with you. So. The wrong observation set produces a negative conclusion and a negative uh, decision. What do you see between those two pages on the left and the right? Don't think of it as two pages. Think of it as two distinct approaches. They represent two observation sets. And each set of observation form a hypothesis for the best way to influence the conclusion and thus the decision. Now, when you think about it that way, you can go back to what I have and let's just look at those two pages and ask yourself the two questions. What's the big difference in the hypotheses? For instance, let's just compare headlines. We're here to help. Let me ask you a question. Right now, think about the landing page you have up and ask yourself, can you take my headline and put it on 21 different pages and it would still apply to other businesses? Couldn't you put it on three? We're here to help could apply to virtually every business in the world. It means nothing. It communicates zero. We sort of think the people thinking about this that we're saying something helpful, like we're telling people that we're for you. But go back, what does the sentence start with? It starts with me, what I want, what I'm here. And then it says help, which is completely vague, and in a situation where you're being sold, not even credible. So the headline is uh, accomplishing something, but I don't think it's very positive. So I don't expect that headline to produce a positive conclusion. And when you take that headline and that same kind of thinking and unfold the rest of the page, you'll see that it produces, uh, I think, an inadequate, uh, an inadequate set of implications and thus an inadequate conclusion and, of course, then a negative decision. Now, look at the other headline. What's it start with? Get a dedicated and licensed teleagent committed to simplifying Medicare for you. Now, I'm just comparing headlines. If we had time, we'd compare both pages in depth, in detail, but I want to go way past anything I've ever done for you today. Uh, I want to take you past all of our optimization work from 30 years in the lab and 20,000 treatments tested, and I want to ask you, how do you start from scratch when you're designing a page? I've never taught that. 
And to do that, you have to understand the sequence of thought and the underlying psychology. But first, let's look at this second page and say, what is the difference and how big is it? That's the two questions. As you've asked that, I'll show you now. The second page produces a 638% increase. And this is for one of the biggest companies. This is an Aetna company. Think about that. What are you really seeing here? Like, how is it? How both pages are saying essentially the same thing. It's not that we have a new message on the other page in its essence, a new offer, let's put it that way. You could say the message is changed, but the essence of the offer, the true value proposition is the same. The only difference is in the articulation of the value proposition. And remember, as I've taught in, in the book that represents 30 years of our research, The Marketer's Philosopher, the essence of marketing is the message and the essence of the message is the value proposition. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this board if I can find an eraser. Somebody help me with that uh, in the studio, please. And in the meantime, I'm gonna take you to one more and we're gonna drill down. I love uh, this particular experiment. This is a really, really capable marketing group. And you're looking at two versions of a page. Which one's the best? I think that's worth voting on. So, uh, Cynthia, and I see, I like the discussion going on between everybody. That's really productive. And it really helps us all learn. And I expect to learn from you and your comments as well. So, but take a look here now and vote A or B. Because this is, um, this is an interesting, this is an interesting uh, set of observations. Which one do you think? A or B? As you're thinking about that, As you think about that, Sean, I just saw your comment about what the lead generation work you're doing. I think that's, uh, that's interesting. I, I, we've done a tremendous amount of research in that space, and maybe we can share some with you or reach out to us. Perhaps we can help you. Anyway, look here, 2017, see the two pages. Tell me which one, A or B. Somebody says A. All right, let's hear you. Reputation Wizard says A. Who says B? Who, all right, here's a B from Jeremiah. All right. B has more value prop versus relying on discounted pricing. Excellent point. Uh, now, there's an assumption with that, Jeremiah, and the assumption is that uh, the negative side of the fulcrum, by uh, adding weight to the one side, we're going to create more balance in the fulcrum, I'm sorry, more off balance in the fulcrum than by taking off negative weight. If you're new to this, you may not know what I'm saying, but go back and watch some of our earlier broadcasts. For the rest of you, I see a B, I see an A, I see another B, I see another B. I'm going to show you something. A is 136 higher. In fact, this organization, I don't think will mind me saying that we drove over 10,000 ticket sales in this experimental program. That's 10,000 paid seats. They're a great group. You should, you should attend the next event. But my point for you is something's happening in the sequence of thought. Now, here's the challenging question for everybody that just joined us or if you've been on from the beginning, I only want you to think about one question. I want you to think, if I had to redesign the page I have up, remember I asked you to pull up your own landing page, if I had never seen this page or I was told start completely over, how would you approach the development, the design, let's call it the strategy, uh, the messaging strategy of that page? What would you do? Where would you start? Do you start writing a headline down? Do you, uh, do you sketch it out on a piece of paper? I'll tell you what, somebody get, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, this is live, and I guess we can do anything we want on live. People would just either like it or laugh at us or run away. Paul, let's get Megan's sketchbook. I mentioned to her I was gonna do this. Like, let's get the big one or the small one, both of them, but can someone get Megan's sketchbook? Megan is a designer working in our team. She literally, we're in a big building, uh, campus, and, uh, but in the, in the center of the campus is my, is my personal office, which is actually a, a, a leadership lab, and we have a bunch of people training to be leaders who live in there with me, so to speak, and Megan's one of those. And I wanna show you her pad. This is how Megan is laying out and thinking about a page, but how would you do it? How would you take a new page and think through the messaging strategy, and what are all the key components? What are the psychological elements? How do you tie them all together? What order do you think about them in? That's what we're going to address in the balance of our time together. And it's gonna require me to do two things. 
I'm going to go over for just a moment to a large infographic. And uh, with that infographic, uh, I want to give you some things that may help you sort of think through. Here we go. I have Austin Spence. Come right up, Austin. Austin's in that leadership program that I just decided. He moved from North Carolina to join us in our lab on four days' notice. He waited a year to get into the program, and he's doing really, really well. He's taken me some sheets. We didn't plan this, although I told Megan I might do this in a future broadcast. So I'm going to try to hold them up and turn them so there's not too much of a glare. I might need help. Uh, Cliff, feel free to coach me or somebody tell me, can they be seen well? Put it in front of the whiteboard, someone said. All right, so look at this. This is Megan's drawings. We're working. These are pages we're working on right now. Do you see how they're pencil sketched? Everybody see that? I'm going to drop another one. Look at this. Again, we're thinking. By the way, she's generating multiple versions. Every page should be thought of not in one sort of a thought cluster, but do at least three creative clusters that enable you to pick the highest and best. And I could go on and on showing you versions of this, but Megan is doing an extraordinary job, and she's young, fresh out of design school and college, and already doing work that you would expect to see from someone with 10 years business. Why, or 10 years experience. Why? Because she's applying a method, a framework that I want to share with you today. So I'm going to take all of this, I'm going to pull it back and say, typically before we ever touch Photoshop, we're sketching out a messaging strategy and we're following this template. Let's pull up the infographic and let's start learning. All right, now this is a big graphic. It could cover a wall. And um, uh, I don't know yet how to get a copy out to people. I don't, we thought about making a poster that you could purchase or something, but just take a look. Uh, I want to start with the beginning. You're going to see sort of how it's laid out. On the left are the psychological elements that we consider. On the right is sort of a way it could lay itself out on a page. You'll notice the first three have to do with something that you can't actually see or connect directly to the page in the beginning. But they're the most important. Without the first three, you can't get the rest right. So I'm going to begin teaching. I don't know if I'll get through all of this today. If I don't, we'll just pick it up in the next YouTube Live and keep rolling. I also have a series of pages that have been submitted for us to look at together in a live op fashion, applying what we're thinking about. But what I want you to do right now, as I begin to teach, go back to the whiteboard, etc., I'm going to keep that up. I'm going to go back and forth. And what I need you to do is to pull up your page. If possible, uh, take a look at that page while you're following the broadcast. If not, you can switch uh, back and forth as you need to. But Yeah, we may pull up your page. And if you want, if you want us to look at it, I don't know when at what point, but send it to Paul via chat. We may look at your page with you. All I want you to do right now is think about that. And so, Cliff, I think we'll go back to the graphic uh, so that everyone can see that. I'll stay there for a minute. I'll just talk before I use the whiteboard. What is that first point? You'll see a number one, and it says profile. Listen, you cannot get the what right. Listen to me again. You cannot get the what right. And you cannot get the how right until you get the who right. Now, think about what I'm trying to say. There's no way to determine what is the best messaging strategy. There's no way to answer the question, how can I uh, design this page so that more people say yes or the most people say yes. You can't answer those questions until you answer the who question. And we are lazy about this today unrelated to this particular broadcast, uh, I was working with Austin Spence, who you just saw come in, and all across the board, we created a chart, and we identified different profiles of people, and we were trying to do something I call funnel logic. And funnel logic is a way to think about uh, both the conversion rate from each step of your funnel and the independent but integrated value propositions that move someone up the funnel in the right sequence, at the right time. But you can't get that right until you answer the who question. And so at the top of this chart we were creating was the who answer. For right now, those of you listening to me, you may be, you may be coming into this broadcast and, and you are uh, in a small entrepreneurial venture. Maybe you're a one-man shop or you've got five people and you're excited. At the same time, I know some of you because we've been interacting uh, in other ways and there are people on this call right now that are from huge organizations. Whatever the situation is, we all got to get the messaging strategy right. So 
I want to challenge you by saying the first question you've got to answer, and it connects to the profile, step one is who? And who is more than a demographic profile? The demographic profile can really confuse you and it can hurt you. Uh, the stereotypical approach to saying, well, I'm going after, you know, an, uh, a white female, the ages of, you know, 35 to 50, who has uh, an income of X, just doesn't really think deeply enough. It's too shallow. People are a mystery. And it's better to organize them not by their demographic profile as much as it is by their decision profile. How do they choose? What is important to them? Now, here's what you're going to look for. You're going to look for correlation between what we might call the decision or psychographic information. I'm going to abbreviate that with the word D because I got a lot of drawing to do here and I'm also going to change markers again. I'm going to give you this green one so I don't use it again. So, so here is what we're looking for. Correlate the decision style and if you see a predominant decision style in the demographic style, so I'm going to put DM for demographic and DC for decision style, then you may find a way to find a subset within your decision style. Now, when you know that, you're on the way to building a predictive model of your customer's mind. But do not get lost focusing on just demographics. That's the lazy way out. Here's the other problem. Now, follow with me carefully because I have different levels of, of sophistication on this call and I also have people with much larger budgets and much bigger staffs. I want to talk right now just to you who has a small organization and you think, yeah, but I don't even, I can't, like, I don't even know how to go there. I can't hire a team. I don't have researchers to do this. Start with this then. If you've had anybody that's purchased before, go back and study your metrics to find your ideal purchasers, the one who give you uh, the most margin or the highest retention, and then look for a real person, not a, not a composite person. Literally, find a person, a real person, that best represents who you're trying to reach. Do I have any writers on here? If you're a writer, just use the chat feature. Say I'm a copywriter, or I write poetry, or nonfiction, or I write... Uh, fiction, just log in and say, yes, I do this, because I want to talk to you for just a second. Now, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Don't design your page until you have a picture of that person. Go to LinkedIn and find them, like literally, or, or do your best to put some sort of representative image of them in front of you. I'm talking to the person who can't hire Accenture to do a $200,000 research project on your audience. And by the way, it may not produce any more than you doing what I'm trying to talk to you about right now. If you don't have any customers yet, you're going to still have to think through which segment in the world right now is being least served and how can I serve them better? I'm talking about in your small world that represents the universe of possible conversions. We call that UPC. In your UPC, who is being served the least? Who can you serve the best? And when you answer that question, you have started to nail down your profile. Now I want to give you permission for something else, okay? By the way, Joshua, I see that you write as a hobby sometimes. Awesome. Paul is a serious writer and he's got lots of poetry and uh, we tease him about it. He's a really, uh, he's really a superb poet. And I just want to say that whenever I write, like The Marketer's Philosopher, the book that you've, the only, you know, I wrote this, it took me 30 years to plan it and I've tested it four years and I made 66 prototypes and we still don't release it till next year. But in it is 30 years of my life, and it's not very long. But I'll tell you this, when I wrote it, I got a crystal clear picture in my mind of who is the person I'm writing for. And I like to actually have a face if I can. And I like to talk to that person. Writing a book is marketing a message. Same thing with a web page. Now, with all that in mind, here's the one thing I want to help you with. You don't need to have this perfect. Most people don't have it 10% of the way. Get more than that and you're ahead of them. Don't be afraid to start with a fuzzy picture. Get it as clear as you can, but allow time to refine it. The more you refine it, the closer you are to achieving superior competitive advantage. This is the profile question. Question number one, do not start your page until you're clear about the who. 
Remember, you can't answer the what question. You cannot answer the how question until you answer the who question. That is profile. Cliff, take us back if you would. He's going to take us back to the diagram, and as he takes us back there, I want to talk to you about number two. Now, I'm going to wax eloquent on number two. I don't mean I'm going to sound eloquent. I mean I'm going to, I'm probably going to have a little passion spill out because this is the greatest mistake I see in page design. By far, we go in with an inaccurate, fuzzy, uh, incomplete objective. Most of our projects fail, not because we can't figure out how, but because we didn't start with reflection and get the what right. To get the what right, you're going to have to go into the why. The, the why will help you get the what, but let me tell you how what plays in a four question approach to page design. The first question is always this, what is my top objective? Did you hear me? The most important thing I'm going to say in these four questions uh, can be locked up in the modifier of the sentence. What was the modifier in that sentence? I'm going to ask it, you write it in here. Here it is. Again, what is my top objective? Somebody tell me, what's the modifier in that sentence? Type it in here into your, into your program. What is the top objective? All right, why you're saying, by the way, thanks Reputation Wizard for the kind words. <laughs> yeah, it's embarrassing to, you know, when you take your whole life and say, this is all I got to show for it. But uh, in terms of research, 40 reflections uh, cost me 30 years. All right, Dave says he thinks the word is top. He's correct. The top, that word top. So let's just think, what is my top objective? Do not ask what is a objective. Do not confuse yourself. Listen to me on this. Every page must focus around an objective that has at least 70% of its weight on one key objective. You cannot divide the page up into objectives like 10% this, 20% that, 30% that, 40% that. And yet most of our pages are designed this way. Why? Because we're not sure what we're trying to accomplish, so we try to accomplish too much. Or because the page represents a compromise in a real estate war between a bunch of people with constituent uh, agendas and they all fight it out until somebody rules you can have this corner and you can have this section, you can have this banner and you can have this block. And so everybody works to get their piece. And in the end, they produce a mess. Someone said, you've heard me teach this for years, that a, that a camel is a horse put together by a committee. Your landing page, unfortunately, is probably a camel. And again, if you're in a big company or a bigger company, it's probably because that page represents a compromise between warring factions, even if you're friends. That's a terrible way to design a page. But if you're in, let's say, a more entrepreneurial or a smaller venture where you've got total control, your lack of clarity produces a magnified lack of clarity on the part of the person visiting the page. You can't imagine that they're going to be as clear as you are when they first come in. So you must be absolutely clear. Wittgenstein, the, the brilliant um, British philosopher, often spoke about perspicuous clarity. In fact, he said almost all of the problems of philosophy can be understood by this lack of perspicuous clarity. And he paid much attention to language. Now, if you're a philosopher, I'm talking about Wittgenstein 2, not Wittgenstein 1, and you'll know what I mean. But for now, all I want you to understand is that you need a page with an objective that is 70% focused on one thing. You know what's better than 70%, in case you're not following me? 80%. Anyone who tell you what's better than 80%? 90%. What's better than 90%? 100%. All right? Now, you can't always do that. Let me give an example. Your page may be, your whole goal may be on the home page to get me to click into the right funnel. Think about that. That may be your entire goal. If so, then design the page to do that. On the other hand, the goal on a product page or on a lead gen page might be to get me to do this one thing, but you have 20% of your space dedicated to a secondary way to capture my email information. So you have a related offer that uh, is occupying 20% of the page's attention. But do not, do not design one of these pages 
that is a combination of blocks and boxes, with every single block and box feeling like something you've got to climb over, because it does. When you put pieces in blocks, it looks like they're unrelated and disconnected. And also, don't follow the Apple idea that I'm not really sure what thing will work best. I'm not saying Apple thinks that way, but many of us do. So we just stack one idea on top of another idea in a long page. This, this kind of design became in vogue post uh, uh, the Apple success. And I've said this many times, do not copy Apple because you don't have their value proposition. I mean, if you're going to copy them, then also make people wait for three days outside the store before you let them in to buy your product. We know better than to do that, but we're doing the same sort of thing. We're making the same sort of mistake in the way we think about our web pages by copying a company that has a product so desirable, people will put up with a lot to get it. Is Apple doing everything wrong? No, no. But frankly, uh, they have led a lot of our designers astray. I need a coherent conversation with a focused objective. Let me give you one more point. I'm going to stop on this second key piece about the objective. But the first question is always, what is my top objective? Everyone clear on that? Now, when you ask that question and you get it down, written, by the way, written at the page. So let's go back. Give me Megan's stuff again, right? Thank you. Paul's got it set over here side. I'm real proud of Megan. She's new with us and she's doing an excellent job. Hey, by the way, I'll take a young, uh, but if you're an experienced designer, don't hear this in the wrong way, but give me a young designer without tons of experience that has created a groove in their mind, it's neuroscience and plasticity, that keeps them from being able to think in a completely radical new way with a paradigm shift. I remember I was solving a problem for one of the biggest brands in America, and I literally had to fly in and create a war room. Uh, there was an emergency. Uh, they launched a new site and conversion dropped by more than 70%, 74 to be precise. And this is an organization that, uh, with revenue in excess of 100, 100 billion dollars. Revenue in excess of 100 billion dollars. So I rushed in, set up a war room. These are my friends. And I tend to work with my friends. I don't want a real business. Business bores me. Uh, I want to learn and grow and have a meaningful life and work with people that uh, I can have a meaningful relationship. And that's the same with the people we serve. I liked this person in particular that was the leader there. I rushed over there. We set up a war room. And he said, you got anything you want? I said, I don't. I don't want all those experienced pros. Give me some young designers and lock the doors and we're gonna fix this. And you know what? I'm sharing that with you, not if you're an experienced designer to in any way uh, diminish you, but to simply say that we gotta think fresh if we wanna get a fresh type of result. We gotta think radical if we wanna see radical performance. And some of us are just, we're trapped in a narrow way to approach things. When Megan first started and she put a beautiful design together, we said, great, but we want three more. And please don't do it in Photoshop. Do it like this. Literally, one, two, three. And she started drawing side-by-side -side approaches, and that allowed us to get optionality and to best represent our hypothesis. So you're going to ask one question. Everyone right now, look at the page you brought. <laughs> Cynthia, don't, don't be put out to pasture. Maybe just come here and straighten us out. Uh, if you were a normal designer, you wouldn't be on here listening to this right now. I say a normal designer. What I mean by that is people who are not trying to constantly learn and grow, you're obviously very different. That's why you're here. And that's, uh, that can happen when you're 80 or it can, you, can, you can petrify when you're 20. It's that young and new is a mental condition. It has nothing to do with age. All right, so take a look here for a second. I have these pages. Now look at yours and say, what is my top objective? Dave Fogel, I saw your laugh out loud. You're way past that now. I just want to point out that, you know, you've probably reached your prime and gone beyond it. Uh, we leave you on here to humor you, but uh, keep trying. <laughs> Paul's, Paul's lying. Dave's on here all the time if you're new, so I'm, I'm teasing him. Please go with me. You need the second objective. Once you know my page objective is to do X. So look at your landing page and try to answer right now. What is the objective of that page? Let's assume you have that. What is the top objective of that page? Finding an objective will never get you there. Then you're going to ask the second question. I'm not going to teach the next three questions, but every project I ever undertake since I was a young man in any discipline is defined by these four questions. What is my top objective? Uh, when I when I understood this approach, it changed my life and my results, it transformed it. I remember as a very young man what it did. It, was, it absolutely changed my entire economic picture too. 
The second question is this, what is the most effective way to accomplish my objective? Now, let me tell you why that's important, because that's not what we ask. We ask, how can I accomplish this objective? How can I design this page? Let's suppose you have the objective right. You have the top objective. You are clear. Do not ask. Do not fall into this trap. Here's the trap. It's happening right now. Why you're on this call, why you're watching me, and wh why this is unfolding all over the country, people are saying, how can I accomplish that? Sorry, that gets a answer, but it doesn't get the answer. And gang, we need to understand the answer, and you're only going to get it when you ask the question right. So the question is, what is the most effective way? Now, what was our modifier in the first question? Top. What is our modifier in the second question? Most effective. If you understand that, you can challenge yourself and you're going to have to generate options. So please, Cliff, uh, show them the graphic and look at it with me and understand that everything happening after point two, and we're going to scroll down. You'll notice one, two, and three are occurring in the mind. They don't directly hit the page, but everything from three down to 21, just scroll slowly, somebody, through this list. From three down to 21, every one of these is an answer to the second question, which is, what is the most effective way to accomplish my top objective? What I've tried to provide you is a flowing framework that you can use to think about your page systematically. I don't want to be one of those unfortunate marketers who has good days and bad days in terms of results and frankly can't attribute why I had the good day and why I had the bad day because I don't have a method. It's like a cook who never looks at recipes. I mean, honestly, if you don't measure anything, I know it's, uh, by the way, I, I'm not a cook, but my wife, I've been married 32 years, is an amazing Southern cook. And, and my daughter is, uh, went to chef school and all that, she's 16. But I've learned from watching them that if you don't measure anything, you don't know how to duplicate success. And you know what you find? You can, you can almost get it most of the time with the stuff you're really familiar with, but every time you try something new, you're in new territory and you can't rely on those old patterns. So you need to measure and you need to know. And my point for you is this framework, it's just a framework. It's just a paradigm, it's just a method, but it provides consistency and it keeps you from missing something important. By the way, we're always improving. You may have a way to improve this. Send it to us. I don't have all the answers. I'm trying to learn. This helps me, but I'll be disappointed if a year from now it's not better than it is right now. So let's keep going and let's be clear. Everything else is about the second objective. Now, I'm going to tell you what the third and fourth are, but I'm not going to teach them. Because you may want these four questions. You may want to write these down. When you put these four together, I think you have the secret sauce. And it's these four questions completely transform my life. And I, uh, I'm almost religiously passionate about their significance. I want you to know that before I ever built a testing program, we built the first on the internet. We built the first behavioral research lab in, in the history of the world here years ago. But I was, I was already excited about testing before anyone on the internet was talking about it because I had learned it in other areas of my life based on these four questions. Here's the first one. Again, I'm just going to list all four now and move on. One, what is my top objective? Two, what is the most effective way to accomplish it? Three, what is the best way to test? Number two, because number two is actually your plan. Number two is your plan. And do you know what a plan is? It's a hypothesis. You're going to see everything start to come together that we've talked about. If you really understand this, your plan is just a hypothesis for how to achieve your objective. And it may be right and it may be wrong. The only way you get it right is to test it in a controlled way that reduces your risk. So the question you must ask is, what is the top way or what is the best way? That's the right choice of words. What is the best way to test Number two. Now, somebody may want to take a guess at the fourth question, but if you don't have the fourth question, you're still lost. Without question three and four, you have a strategy of hope. I'll try it, see if it works. I'll achieve success or I'll achieve failure. And by the way, people all around us have done that. Some succeed and some fail. And we treat this, the people who succeed as if they're special, but a lot of times they were lucky. People who failed were just as good as them. I don't want to, 
I don't want to depend on luck. I want to create a methodical way. And I was thinking like this before there was an internet to test on. Before 1993, that's when we had HTML and began to get web pages. So I saw suddenly how we could use digital to test everything I was doing offline. How I could use digital to test my hypotheses about people's mind and their decision process. And eventually how to just get commercial success by doing this. Which brings me to the last question. In view of my test results, how do I adjust, now here this is very important, either number one or number two. Number one is my objective. Sometimes the test results come back and you realize my problem is I have the wrong objective. It's unrealistic. It's impossible. You may be trying to hire somebody to fulfill a role and you've hired three people and all of them have failed. Your problem is probably the objective, not the person. When three really good people have been put in the role and they've done their best and they can't make it work, sometimes the problem is your objective. The objective you give them is wrong. I'm just using that as an example. So how do I test one, or how do I adjust one, my objective, or two, my plan? You say, well, the plan? What is the plan? The plan is, I'll say it this way, the plan equals the most effective way. Now, I could stop today. If you would take these four things to heart, you can transform your business. It's not just about a web page. It's about your product launch. It's about your hiring strategy. It's about your capital plan. It's about all the things we do in our life. We can transform uh, our results if we learn to think with Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein's perspicuous clarity. All right, now, having said that, uh, some of you real smart people are saying, well, that sounds like the scientific method. It does, doesn't it? And some people do this intuitively. I didn't think of the scientific method when I worked it out, but I see how it parallels part of the scientific method, all of it if it's used right, but most of us don't even do the scientific method right. And I mean, most scientists don't apply it right. But that's a different day, a different question. And philosophy of science. If you're interested in that, read Karl Popper. Or read Thomas Kuhn. Either one will uh, surprise you. For the rest of us, you need to know what's number three. I can't, it's odd to me because uh, when I get to number three, I'm just as, I'm just as uh, fired up. You say, why? Because I see this failure as much as I see number two and number one. And what's so funny is when I go to look, or tragically funny, ironic, is when I go to look at someone's work, they've skipped three and waded right into six or seven. A lot of them go straight to seven. And they don't, they're not prepared. You can't get to seven before you figured out one through three. So let's, let's, let's learn why. As I'm going into this, by the way, uh, I'm watching the interaction back and forth. I need to do a check with you. I'm going to write on the board. I'm going to teach number three, and I want you to understand how this is progressing. For those of you that might be impatient, this will get down to how do you think about your headline. And we can give you resources. You know we've taught that here. But if you learn what I'm talking about today, everything you do after that has a higher chance of succeeding. Is this helping you? I'd like to get your feedback. Are you following with me? Am I... I believe in what I'm doing, so I, I hope I'm right, but uh, if, am I too abstract for you? Uh, does this make sense? Can you see its value if you really apply it? Let me know. Talk to me. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do is take you now to, to the third piece. This is big. All right, let's suppose that we've, we've got our profile. We know who. We've got our objective. We know what. Now we're moving to how. All right? And I'm going to make this dead simple. I think I'm going to... I'm going to look at one, maybe I'm going to look at one of the live op pages, okay? So I'll pick one that will help, I haven't seen them. So I'll pick one that illustrates my point as Paul pops one up for me. I need to see it full screen, somebody, so I can really determine uh, if it is the easiest one to use as an example for teaching purposes. Yes? I like, by the way, if you say, why well, haven't you seen them? Because I like not to see them before I teach. I'd like it to be, you know, sort of real time and flowing. Uh, but... As we, as we go full screen, unlock the world of science. Okay, I want to see that full screen. It's not full screen. Keep it full screen for me so I can see it too. I have huge monitors all around me, but uh, I got bright lights here too. Uh, can someone scroll down? All right, so look, look at what we have here. All right, what are we trying to accomplish? Somebody tell me the page objective. You might be able to guess it. It's pretty clear what the page objective is, although, man, I can get a 
handy dandy t-shirt it looks like on top of that, which is great. Take 50% of my page and sell me a t-shirt. You see the problem with the objectives? Do you see that? Do you see the conflicting objectives there? But scroll down a little bit. I'll just stop right there. We'll skip the top piece and get right to there. Unlock the world of science. How many of you know that's a weak headline? Uh, we've taught uh, this. I get all sorts of problems with this page, but I'm talking about what's its objective? Somebody type it in. Join. All right. Dave says join. All right. You're right. I think they want us to become a member of something. So we know uh, we, <laughs> we imply the page's objective. All right. It's not a bad subheader, your subscription, uh, period. No, that's bad. It's not a complete thought. AAS membership, period. Too confusing. Uh, yours for as little as $50. That headline could be rewritten, and if you want to think about a better one, write it while I'm talking, but don't miss what I'm saying, okay? Uh, if you go to write this page from scratch, design it. By the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't optimize the page. I'd, I'd burn it down and start over. I'd be, I'd be with Megan, one of our designers, doing this, okay? Because, well, you... You can't see me right now, I don't think. Stay on the page. I'm holding up all those drawings again. But for that to happen, I got to ask a really critical question. So Cliff, take me to the uh, graphic, and then we're going to go back to the page. The graphic first. What is the third step? Graphic, Cliff. There we go. Third step. I know there's a delay. Uh, the third step is the type. What is my approach? All right. So I'm going to explain that to you. If I know, I'm going to abbreviate, my objective, my top objective is to sell a subscription, and let's say that's for the path, then I suppose my top objective for the page is to get me to click on that button. Now, I would challenge that because there's different ways to approach this, but let's suppose, you know, we want people to ultimately subscribe and, and tentatively what we want them to do or provisionally is click on that button, the join button, all right? With that in mind, what we often do is we design a page. Instead of asking the question, what are the approaches used across the world? The, there, listen guys, how many ways can you design a subscription page? I've actually cataloged them. When I sit down to do this, I don't just do what comes to me naturally. I don't just best guess. I categorize. So let's talk about them. One way to do a subscription page, you'll know this, is, is with a clear, uh, value proposition and a form right on the page where you sign up right there. This page is not doing that. That's a different approach. Another approach, and I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna write in English because I don't have time. And if you're trying to figure out my language, I just need to make a sort of, so uh, some sort of symbol. So the first approach is with the subscription page uh, and the form right on it. There's one, okay? Another is with a comparison chart. So now we have a chart comparing Levels or benefits, perhaps with, uh, of subscription levels or with competitors. A third way is uh, a two-step, a two-step piece where we first get your email address. So I'm going to, I'll show you what I mean. And then once we have that, we take you to the second step. But if you don't complete the second step, we have your email address so we can remarket to you, get you back to the page and try to drive more subscriptions. So for that, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave one form field for an email address. Are you starting to follow the logic here? Well, how else can you sell a prescription? I could keep going, but until I have examples all across this page, let's say of the top seven, I don't even know what to do next on this page. That's the first step. Catalog the approaches. And each one represents a hypothesis for the general approach. And now you're going to combine that with a messaging component and the hypothesis and the messaging strategy form your first version of the page and if you're really determined to get a win maybe you're redesigning your site don't design just one of these let's pick the three that we think are the best so I'm gonna go comparison chart the two-step is always really good maybe not best but it's typically good and we'll take a third one over here whatever it is now in a real web design, I would not have just launched my new site. Once I launched my site, I would have told, let's suppose you're a larger company. This doesn't matter. If you're a smaller company, you don't have to do this. But let's suppose you're a larger company. I'd say to my boss, we're not really launching uh, for 30 more days, but we're moving into what we call the calibration period. This is not a soft launch. That's about figuring out if the stuff works. Figure that out before you launch. This is the calibration period where I literally go live with three versions. 
and I let the audience tell me which one of these is going to get me in the ballpark. Now look, when you've done that right, you've first got into the right, going back to my metaphor, ballpark. Now work on your home run. But if you're in the wrong ballpark and you hit a home run, it doesn't matter. It still doesn't go up on the scoreboard. You still lose. While I'm talking to you right now, many of you are testing, but you're not even in the right category. Let's suppose you're over here. I'm going to put an X to represent it's wrong. And you're testing iterations and getting diminishing returns on your testing program. This is because you haven't thought categorically. First, before you thought too specifically. So what am I trying to say about these three pieces right now? If you think about the three steps in my 21 sort of psychological elements, is your first piece is to go back, pan back before you focus in. Think about your camera. You know, go wide angle before you go uh, into a you know, tight focal. Here's how that happens. First test page category. We call this page category. Test page category, and then when you get a winning category, let's suppose the winning category is this one. It looks like it's producing the most. Now you create alternate test designs with variable clusters working on your calls to action and your other pieces. This is how you design an intelligent DOE, a design of experiments. Now, you might say, well, I'm just not that sophisticated. Anybody on this call, listen to me, any one of you, I, you know, there's enough about marketing all over the internet. A lot of it's weak, but uh, my whole focus, at least our focus at Mech Labs, is on the marketer themselves. The reason I, I like seeing your names and talking to you is I'm not teaching some vague thing. I'm talking to people, and I want a real relationship with real people. And I want to look at my life when I'm sitting in a rocking chair and look back and say I had meaningful relationships. I don't want to be able to say, well, you know, I was one of the 10 biggest companies in X. Who gives a damn? What difference will that make? Nothing to me. It might to somebody else, and I respect that, but not to me. I want to grow. I want to grow personally more than I want to grow a company. I figure if I keep growing personally, I might be able to grow a company but I want to grow and I want to help other people grow. So I'm saying this to you out of, uh, I, I suppose, uh, professional empathy, because we're all doing this together. You can do this. You can go right now on the internet, pick the top 20 sites you can find, or go down to the top, you know, find 21 people trying to do the same thing you do, even if it's not the same business. They don't have to be your competitor. And figure out what are the main categories, the main approaches being used for subscription, for lead gen, or free commerce. Once you get page approaches in your mind, then you can design a categorical test that helps you get into, as I said earlier, the zone, the ballpark. Once you are in the zone, then you can do iteration testing until you get the very best performing page. Back to my graphic, Cliff. <laughs> uh, by the way, so here we are. You can see the whole graphic now. I've gotten through three. I'll get through a lot more next week. Uh, no, leave, leave it out for a second, just so I can see the big picture, and then we'll zoom in. Uh, I want to take you through all of this, but I want to get your feedback before I do it. Because I, I looked, uh, and I don't think I got a lot of feedback. Is, I, I see some from uh, Jeremiah. Uh, is this helping you? Are you interested? Do you want me to teach the rest of this next week? If so, give me feedback, because I'll switch if I don't think it's the right thing for you. I know that for us here, this approach is transformative. It's straightforward, and it helps us. But what I, I want to do is make sure I'm, I'm putting you first and not me first. Uh, not what I want to teach, but what you want to learn. So it, your feedback's really, really important. What I'll do is break this down. And if I get it all done next week, good. And if I don't, I won't. That's the value of doing YouTube Live. I can just do whatever it takes to help you. And so, uh, so that's, the, that's the piece we're going to learn. And I want to do this for, with you right now. I've never done this before. Uh, we, we've mentioned th the book, but uh, we're not releasing it worldwide until next year. We've been testing. We went through six uh, printings, uh, but we haven't marketed. We did that little Facebook test for a day and a half and shut it off because we sold too many books. Um, we didn't want to sell too many before the publishing because it doesn't count on all the lists and so on before you do. But I'm going to start doing some testing now with my own audience. So you can get it. I don't know if Paul's got the page up, but I am... Uh, I am pointing to it because you're going to start to see this in our emails and other things. If, you ever, if Paul's looking to bring it up. Anyway, there's a place now where you can get this. If you buy it, here's why I'm talking to you about it. Yes, I'd like to sell it, but honestly, your purchase isn't going to finance our company. 
we're not wanting to sell more than a limited version, uh, a number of these. So this is not, uh, a, I'm not ashamed of it, but to doing it, but it's not a classic like sort of, you know, uh, sales piece at the end of YouTube Live. The reason I'm doing it is you guys have got insights. If you actually get a copy of the book, it has a place for you to give us feedback and information where you can, a special email address, where as you read it, what are your questions? What are you learning? I'm using this final round of the next six months of testing. I've tested, believe it or not, four years, been testing it. 66 prototypes, but I'm locked by the end of the year. And so I'm looking for people who want to get all the contents there. There's two versions now. We only had this before, but now we have a less expensive linen edition alongside of the leather. You can get it. Paul's putting in the URL. I don't know what it is, Paul. Should I say it or? It... Map.flintmclaughlin.com. You can go there, but you can also just click on the link. If you want it, you can get it now. In the meantime, I'm prepping for next week. We're going to move right on to the fourth item in these 21 psychological elements. Please think about your landing page. Please keep the feedback coming. And please know that I am so grateful that you trust us enough to share your time and your thinking.